Today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members, your mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or on silent or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. This session will be recorded in video and audio and accessed live via online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Before we start uh, our agenda, I would like to welcome two m- new members of the Committee. Um, Mr Andrew Muir, who has replaced Mr Trevor Lunn, and Mr Matthew O'Toole, who is replacing the late John Dallet. You are both very well- welcome, gentlemen, and, uh, to the Committee. I look forward to your contributions when we get back to the meat of our work. Uh, agenda item one, apologies. No, none? Okay. Okay. Item two, minutes of the March the 19th meeting are pages five through to nine. Um, members, uh, are you really happy enough that I sign them? Okay. Uh, in terms of any correspondence, um, I will sign the minutes on your behalf. Okay. Item three, matters arising, pages 10 to 15. Members, refer to your packs the PAC press release on the death of Mr. Dallet, our former colleague. Uh, during Mr. Dallet's illness, uh, I sent a letter in his stay in hospital. I sent out a card on behalf of the committee. Uh, and then, of course, sadly, he died uh, from his illness. Um, I have sent a sympathy card to the family and also released a press release uh, on behalf of the committee. Um, Mr. Dallet was the longest serving member of the committee. He joined the committee in May 2000. And the press release dealt with those issues. Obviously, uh, his loss is a significant loss to his family in particular, his his wife and his children, uh, and to his party colleagues uh, at large, and in particular the SDLP in the Northern Ireland Assembly. So before we start our meeting, I think it might be appropriate if members wish to um, pay tribute to Mr Dallet, um, uh, Mr Beggs, Deputy Chair. <coughs> Certainly, John, John. I served alongside John and pre- some previous uh, public accounts committee, though I, the re- a period where I wasn't on it, where John was still a member. Um, he was always known to be very diligent in uh, his questioning and uh, representing the best uh, interests of the public in dealing with every issue that came across, uh, and he always worked. Uh, not from any narrow interest, but on behalf of the, of the public. And I think he was uh, a very valued me- member of this committee who will be sadly lost. It's sadly missed. Okay. Mr McHugh. Uh, and again, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I never really knew uh, John Dallard myself, but I was well aware of his uh, reputation, his reputation as, a, as a representative of his own party and the diligent way that he would have applied himself to his work. And um, the relationships that he had developed uh, within uh, the House here uh, uh, across all parties and that as well, too. Uh, and again, uh, my sympathies and that were with his family uh, and his extended family, his brother, whom I, I did know through uh, my uh, previous um, career. And, and, and again, uh, just like his brother John, they were always very mannerly. Uh, well-informed people who had worked diligently on behalf of, of everyone. Just there, yes, Jay Grohl, and the right hand of God, may his soul be. Mr O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, to remember John in this way. Um, I was struck when you mentioned that he had been on this committee since um, 2000, 20 years. Obviously, there were some years when um, the, the, the Assembly was in abeyance, but it just shows the I think the, the level of the contribution that John Dallet made to public life um, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, working on behalf of people from all sides of the community and from um, uh, and from all uh, perspectives, he um, is an enormous loss to our party and I think to, to, to <coughs> public life in this place more generally. And I would like to, I suppose, put on the record my uh, sense of humility uh, at, in a sense, taking his seat today and succeeding him. 
and my, my wish that I contribute just a little bit uh, uh, to, to, you know, to the extent that he has o over this past um, few decades in this assembly. Yeah, um, I've only been in MLA for a short period of time, but I had a chat with John down the corridor there about the work that he's done, you know, diligent work here in the PAC. And uh, it was a reflection of the character of John, is that he, the first thing he asked for was for the telephone number for Stuart Dixon, uh, one of my colleagues who's recovering from um, cancer operation last Christmas and wanted to make contact with him to offer his best wishes. And I said an awful lot about John in terms of his compassion for other people. I'm wanting to do that, so I think he'd be greatly missed, not only by his family, but by his party and by this place. Okay, thank you very much, members. Um, I think there will be an opportunity at a later time uh, when the House is able to sit free from restriction for some uh, contributions we made in the chamber. But as I said, on behalf of the committee, I did send on uh, our sympathies and condolences to the family uh, and uh, put out a public uh, statement on behalf of the committee expressing those sympathies and condolences publicly as well. Um, members, I just want to draw attention to uh, the revised guidance for committees updated on the 29th, 27th of April 2000 at pages 12 to 15 of your pack. In a so this meeting will be held in accordance with the temporary standing orders 115 and 116. That is, to consider only matters relating to COVID-19 response and any other essential business Therefore, our business will be limited under these standing orders. Are you content to proceed? Okay. <clears throat> uh, item four, declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register irrelevant financial or other interests in the members' rent, uh, interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare? Okay. Item five, correspondence, pages 18 to 40. Members, um, please refer to the Clark's memo, the 27th of May, 2020, pages 18 to 20, of your pack, and the whistleblower's correspondence at pages 21 to 35 of your pack. It includes letters dated the 6th of April, 20, 20th of April, 21st of April, 15th of May, and 18th of May. The committee wrote to the whistleblower uh, on the 20th of May through Leslie Hogg, chief executive of the Northern Ireland Assembly on behalf of the Public Accounts Committee requesting to allow uh, me to follow your submission on the 2nd of April 2020 to the Northern Ireland Audit Office for their input and to allow me to follow any further correspondence that I feel appropriate to external body including the Audit Office. It is felt that another body is better to equip to answer the question. The whistleblower's response is at page 31 of your pack and dated the 21st of April 2020, declining that request. Unfortunately, that leaves us limited options on how the committee moves forward with this matter. So therefore, members, are you content that we seek legal advice on the whistleblower, the, what powers this par uh, committee has to investigate the matter further on behalf of the whistleblower and write to the Northern Ireland Office, uh, Audit Office seeking information on their whistleblowing process, whether it was adhered to in relation to the case? Um, members, please refer to the clerk's memo. Uh, sorry, we'll deal with that first. Are members content we do that? Seek legal advice? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Clerk content? Yep. Content. Okay. <clears throat> members, please refer to the clerk's memo they dated the 27th of May 2020 at page 36 to 38 of your pack and correspondence from the Permanent Secretary for the Department of Communities, Tracy Maharg, dated the 7th of May 2020 at pages 39 and 40. The letter is in relation to the provision of indemnity cover during COVID-19, providing a data sharing agreement with retailer, retailers up to a value of £5 million. Clark, can you brief the committee? Um, yes, Chair. Um, as the letter outlines, it's normal practice that when government department proposes to undertake a contingent liability in excess of 250000 uh, for which there is no specific statutory authority for the department concerned to present to the Assembly a minute giving particulars of the liability created and ex explaining the circumstances um, is, is issued. Um, and that there is a 14 day um, period in which this is done, except in cases of special urgency, which this um, would appear to be. Um, 
The, the, the scheme then is um, to arrange with major retailers a priority online shopping system, which can be used by COVID-19 shielding members of the community. Um, as part of the system, there's a data sharing agreement with retailers, and within this, there's a provision for an indemnity by the department up to a maximum value of five million. Um, however, to avoid delays to the introduction of the scheme, uh, the Permanent Secretary has written to the Committee to report the indemnity and explain why the, the Department proposes to proceed immediately. Um, the Department of Finance has approved the proposal uh, and the Minister has, briefed, um, has been briefed. Um, in terms of the guidance uh, for managing public expenditure in Northern Ireland, the procedure that the Permanent Secretary has um, done would appear to adhere to that, those guidelines. Um, the guidance states that such minutes should be laid in the Assembly and should describe the amount, explain which bodies are expected to benefit um, and why the matter is urgent um, and explain the authority for any expenditure required under the liability um, that would normally be sought <coughs> through the normal estimates procedure. Um, and copy both the PAC and the departmental committees, which um, the permanent secretary has done. So just for noting. Yeah. So really, it's it's just for noting. And if um, you would like further information on this or explanation, I'm sure uh, the CNAG would be happy to mm -hmm. to do that. Well, I'm, yes. I may chair. Sorry, um, this is a very brief and probably very stupid question, but it would be helpful. Um, and it may be a very straightforward way of getting the information to understand precisely what the indemnity is for. What is the? I just don't completely understand what the potential, where the risk is that, that requires an indemnity. Yeah, but I'm not sure the clerk's in a position to answer that question. So no, no, indeed. If, if, yeah. yeah. So you think the auditor general might be in a position to answer it? Yeah, I'm certainly. Um, he would be in a position to um, explain. You know, has yeah. due process been okay. followed? And I, I would imagine he'd be able to say a bit more about this as okay. he's familiar with it. Well, subject to that clarification, whenever he comes in, uh, we're just being asked to note this, members, because obviously the people who will really scrutinise are the Department of Communities in the, in the yeah. committee there in finance. So, members can tend to note. Tend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Item six, the ministerial direction uh, D, uh, that is in Department of Economy and the Department of Finance, COVID-19 business support grant schemes and COVID-19 hardship fund for micro businesses, pages 41 through to 107. At this stage, I'd like to invite Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, Controller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland, Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer, and Mr. Patrick Barr, Director of Northern Ireland. Audit office to join the meeting. I think Mr. Barr is a new appointment, and this will be his first meeting. Is that right? Members are referred to the clerk's memo dated the 27th of May 2020, pages 42 to 45 of your pack, which gives background note on the ministerial directions. At pages 46 to 49 of your pack is a letter from Kieran Donnelly, the controller and auditor general, dated the 23rd of April, providing details of the ministerial direction in respect of the grant system from DE and DOF during COVID-19, specifically COVID-19 10,000 business support grant scheme and COVID-19 20,000 business uh, support grant scheme for retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure. And at pages 50 through to 91 of your pack is the correspondence from the Department for the Economy Minister and the Executive in respect to the grant assistant. Okay, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Over to you. Thank you. Um, well, as you say in your pack, um, we have three ministerial directions. Uh, these are not unusual things. Um, I think in previous mandates, we always had two or three directions every year. Now, direction is where, um, I suppose, a minister instructs the permanent secretary to proceed with a spending proposal, notwithstanding objections from the permanent secretary. Uh, the Bible on managing public money, managing public money will require uh, an accountant officer if he is uh, 
concerns about regularity, propriety, or value for money to, to, to seek a, a direction. Um, we have three directions here. Uh, I note from GB, I was talking to my counterpart in London, there are 11 directions nationally. And uh, probably not a, a surprise in the, cir in the current circumstances uh, where uh, new schemes had to be uh, assembled and uh, put through very, very quickly, and not the normal sort of time frame to do a, an in-depth value for money assessment. So in a sense, uh, these are not a, a, a surprise. Uh, proper process, I think, was followed. There, there's a lot of process around directions and, and how they work. Uh, where there is a direction, um, there is a requirement that I am notified, and I have a requirement to notify you. So it means where a direction, that the issue I'm concerned, is on my radar and is on your radar. That's all we're required to do at the moment. Uh, and normally, if it's a direction, uh, you know, I would keep a close eye on the on the subsequent expenditure, uh, and there'd be an early opportunity to do that. Uh, first one was when we audit the Department of Economy's accounts for 1920, so we'll get a bit of insight into that. Uh, Patrick, on my left, is our new director, who's responsible for the the audit of the Department of the Economy. So, uh, and uh, we'll be into that work in the next uh, month or so. I would also plan to uh, do an overview of uh, COVID-related expenditure across Northern Ireland and uh, just to map out uh, all the different uh, funding streams. And there are many of them. Um, uh, just an informative report. Uh, the National Audit Office in London produced a, a factual report uh, last week. And I hope to do something similar within the next month uh, before the summer holidays, mm -hmm. just to map out all the different uh, spending uh, flows now. Uh, the three uh, schemes here are the three <coughs> that the directions related to, if you add them up, the total spent and commitment, there's 460 million. One of them, the hardship fund, it's actually got a cap on it, of 40 million. So, so we're talking about uh, huge amounts of public money, but even that uh, probably pales into insignificance uh, when, when actually set against the, the cost of furloughing, which is a huge amount of money. Uh, nationally, uh, I think that's estimated, uh, the National Audit Office have estimated 80, 80, 50 to 80 billion. And 50 to 80? Uh, 50, I think 50 billion. Uh, well, f full support for business nationally, 80 billion of which over 50. And this is just an estimate at this stage on, on furloughing alone. And uh, total um, COVID related expenditure nationally, 124 billion. So the sums of. Including the 80? Uh, yes. So the sums of money are, are huge, and the supporting business component uh, is one of the, the biggest aspects, uh, much bigger than, I suppose, uh, the health-related expenditure. Uh, so uh, we're talking about huge amounts of, of money. Uh, in the, I'll take these uh, as a package because uh, the accounting officer has highlighted uh, similar sort of risks across all three schemes. Uh, he alludes to things like uh, fraud risk, and that's something we'd be alert to. Uh, I'd be interested in my teams to be looking at uh, the interaction between all the different uh, schemes and make sure there's no overlap between them. Uh, we'd be working closely with the department on the use of uh, data interrogation techniques to actually pick up potentially you know, fraudulent claims early on. Um, the accounting officer also alludes to uh, the risk of uh, an excess vote. That's really where the, the spend would be greater than what the Assembly has authorised. Um, and there's a, you know, a detailed protocol how, how we deal with excess votes, uh, where uh, spend is higher than the Assembly has authorised. That is approved retrospectively by the Assembly. I would do a report, the report would come to you. Uh, but uh, th there's judgment in how 
to be applied in different circumstances. So uh, in most cases, uh, in the normal world where you had an excess vote, that would be indicative of poor financial management. In these particular cases, uh, uh, the excess vote, I would imagine, is completely outside the control of the, the public bodies concerned. Uh, so it would be more of a technical issue, but I would still be required to, to bring a report to you. Uh, but it wouldn't be a critical report mm. uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it would not be indicative of poor financial management. I hope that gives you okay. just a brief yeah. overview of w what the sort of issues okay. are. Members, are you content that we deal with uh, items six and seven together, i.e. all of these three, just save time in terms of processing it? As, as Mr Donnelly said, and I think at our last meeting, I remember you and I having a chat about the difficulty because things were happening so quickly in, in business and <coughs> the wider community needed such a quick and swift response from government that we do have to be mindful. I'm not often so kind to civil servants, with due respect to the clerk and the deputy clerk, but the civil servants were putting together packages and, and legislation in a number of days that normally would take months. Uh, so we do have to be mindful of that at this stage. Now, Mr Donnelly has made it very clear in terms of we are not here to interrogate this because we that piece of work has not been done. Uh, but it's simply uh, this is a direction from ministers. And Mr. Donnelly is making us aware of it. Nevertheless, members may well have questions uh, around the issue, but I would just ask members to be mindful of the fact that those questions may be more in depth and far reaching than Mr. Donnelly might be able to answer at this stage because he hasn't done a piece of work. Mr. Hillage. Chair, uh, just seeking clarification as well. Obviously, this is a fund that will be <coughs> really audited at the time and whatnot, but as many of us in this room, I suppose, have been to the forefront in yeah. lobbying business yeah. they access these funds. Does that bring us into any sort of conflict or declaration of interest that we should be making? Or? That's a good point. Uh, I, I don't think at this point uh, it, it may be something to think about further down the track if I subsequently do a report on these matters and uh, bring them to the committee. So that's something that could be looked at in uh, due course, I imagine. I know what other people yeah, uh, and I, I do appreciate that uh, at the front line, I suppose members will be, you know, approached and just uh, probably fairly relentlessly about the various gaps in, in provision. And in fact, um, the third scheme there, the, the hardship scheme, the whole design of that was to plug gaps. Uh, where, where, where certain types of business and smaller micro businesses and uh, social enterprises were maybe fallen through the, the cracks of, uh, of the other schemes. Mm. So uh, I'm mindful of all of that. Yeah, I think, I think it's a fair point that um, certainly I have a number of businesses and continue to do, do so. Um, not all of them from North Belfast either who have been in contact around these issues. So. I suspect all members may be in a position where they're going to have to do exactly as Mr Hildich has outlined. Mr Beggs, Vice Chair. The, the Permanent Secretary highlighted that there is a high risk associated with the self-declared application process and the potential for fraudulent applications, and that's why he, he, he wasn't content with it and sought ministerial direction. Um, but I, I certainly can see there was a need to get something out on the ground quickly, and mm -hmm. even as of yesterday, I had a small business chasing me to try and uh, find out why they haven't received their funds. So there is some administrative checking going on and uh, 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 to try and uh, minimise uh, fraudulent applications. Um, but I, I can see why it all happened so fast. My question then is, um, is it the sort of scheme that you should be referring to the National Fraud Initiative as well to ensure that there is uh, overlapping checking that no one has uh, got involved as well as uh, some other checks, as it would be, uh, if it's being said that this has the potential for fraudulent applications, there would need to be scrutiny on it. Uh, yeah, the National Fraud Initiative has moved on quite a bit uh, this last couple of years. Um, it started off as, I suppose, historical data matching after the event, uh, and uh, there's now techniques where it can be done in real time before the payments are actually made in some cases. Uh, the Cabinet Office now runs the, 
the National Fraud Initiative, and uh, my people, my counter-fraud team, have alerted uh, certainly the Department of Economy to some of the techniques that can be used there on, before payments are made in the first place. That will take us, you know, it will be helpful to some extent. Could I ask either of our two members who are joining us um, by audio if they have any questions? Mr. Harvey, Mr. Uh, Ms. Flynn, any questions? No, thank you, Chair. Mr. Harvey? Can you hear us, Mr. Harvey? Um, everyone content? Mr. Muir? Yeah. Sorry, right, sir. No, all fine. Just because it was on mute, but it's okay. Work all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would preface my comments with what Mr. Hilditch has said. I think many of us have lobbied for these schemes to be introduced and for the payments to be made for justifiable reason and businesses contacting us. But we're fully aware of the the risks that are associated with that, and they're outlined within the paper. Um, in relation to the hardship fund. In the paper which has been presented to the committee, on page 99, it says social enterprises and charities will be able to access the fund if they meet the criteria. I understand that that, cri that decision was then since changed and that charities are not allowed to access that. It's only social enterprises who don't have charitable status. So it's just in terms of the actual decision that was taken, you know, was there a further paper presented uh, around that? I'm not aware of that. that. That's a bit of detail that um, I, I've just yeah. I'm learning about for the first time. So that's something uh, we can look into. Uh, we certainly, know the charity sector has been particularly hard hit in terms of uh, you know income and uh, whether there are other measures that um, relate to that sector through the Department of Communities is something we could look at. That's why I think it's so important to map all of these different initiatives out right across the whole of government to see how they all fit together. Okay. Yeah. And just around the, the value for money issue, which was obviously in contention around this, um, how would, what, what would have been the, the test that would have been applied to make sure it met the value for money? Would it have been that these uh, grant schemes would have been more tailored, more targeted? Uh, possibly, and it, because they had to be reduced at, or produced at great pace, yeah. obviously uh, the design is not as sophisticated as it might otherwise have been. Uh, the two main schemes were actually anchored in, uh, on the rates schemes, so that they used the rates database as sort of a, a launch pad for the, two, for the two schemes, and that seemed a, pragma a pragmatic and sensible where to proceed. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for coming to present us today. Um, and notwithstanding the same uh, caveats that others have made around active lobbying for the disbursement of this, these monies, uh, um, are these uh, quite broad questions? Are these the largest ever directions that you have? See, are you, are you aware of larger directions in terms of public money? Uh, I'm just thinking of the top of my head. Oh, pr probably yes, by by a long long way. Yeah. Just by, by the I'd nature of things. Um, historically, with directions on some very small amounts of public money, I can think of ones in the, the agricultural area where there were hardship schemes for. Farmers getting, getting. Uh, and the amounts of money might have been, you know, s even less than a million. So this is in a, a totally different area. Normally, where you have a direction, it would be on a maybe a selective financial assistance to a particular company or, or a you know a, 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 an exceptional support scheme, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but they, these are on a different on a different scale, money wise. Uh, I suppose uh, the Department of Economy will probably be particularly careful, uh, maybe to, to seek directions because in the RHI debacle, that I think was debated whether there should have been directions and weren't. And uh, in this uh, arena, in the arena I work, uh, often um, it's the absence of a direction is uh, is the bigger is the bigger issue. 
Uh, so when I do a report on an area of public expenditure and um, a department says, uh, you're going too hard on us because uh, the minister was pushing a, a, a particular initiative, uh, I would give no weight to that argument in the absence of a direction. Uh, so what I'm really saying here is in the absence of a direction, the accounting office of the permanent secretary is fully accountable for the expenditure where there's a direction the, the minister takes uh, responsibility. And have, you have you received any other, uh, are the, uh, is this the sum total of the ministerial directions you've been made aware of for the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not to say there, there, there may be others that would come uh, and uh, where I've had some conversations with other permanent secretaries have said, uh, have you any directions coming? So I'm not, a, not aware of any. What would be the, just uh, a couple of other departments have this is in no way imputing them, but agriculture communities have both, there have both been schemes which have been, I would imagine, fairly novel. I don't know about contentious, but um, is there a time limit on which you're required to be informed, the CNAG? Uh, there's no, normally no strict time limit, but um, certainly the convention would be, uh, if there is a direction, I would know about it far, fairly quickly. Uh, you mentioned the de Department of the Communities, and there's actually a, an array of different initiatives in, in, in that department, uh, but they're much smaller schemes money-wise than the, the three we're talking about here today. So in the five to ten million pound range, uh, I think there's, there's quite a few schemes. That, you know, there's the uh, provision of food, Parsons to vulnerable people, initiatives of, of that nature. So there, there's quite a, quite a number there, but none of them are uh, uh, huge in terms of public expenditure. But you've uh, had small, you've had some relatively small sums being referred for direction before, as you said. Yes, of that, of that uh, and uh, the one thing I, I, I don't do, I don't attempt to second guess uh, permanent secretaries no, when, when they the, the seek directions. Uh, they have to come to their own judgments, and some that have slightly different risk appetites when, when it comes to this. And I just, my final question is, thank you, Chair. Is um, you mentioned at UK level the number of directions that had been sought? What was that? Was that eighteen? Did you say uh, eleven? Oh, eleven. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So, so just in terms of the the the, um, the monies nationally, eighty billion for the furlough scheme, and one hundred and twenty-four billion in total, and up to date in terms. Uh, of no, I think it was fifty 124, something. One hundred and twenty-four. Sorry. One hundred and twenty-four in terms of total. Uh, I'm quoting from a national audit yeah. office report that was issued last week. So the headline figures was one hundred and twenty-four billion. Uh, uh, and that's on a, an estimate. It, mm. it's obviously a, it can't be a completely precise figure at this stage. Yeah. Uh, of which uh, 80 thereabouts ballpark uh, was on business support. Yeah. And of the 80, over 50 was on furloughing alone. Uh, and I suppose it, it stands to sense that uh, the real big expenditure is is around furloughing. Okay. Um, so, in terms of directions, um, you have a none from the Department of Communities? Um, no. Okay. Mr McHugh? Mm -hmm. uh, if I could go over, Sean, you Foster, you're welcome here today as well. Um, just to reinforce the point that was raised earlier on there in relation to the hardship fund and so on, and particular uh, charities that where they've been excluded. Now, social enterprises, most social yeah. enterprises are actually registered as charities as well. So in fact, by including social enterprises and excluding charities, you end up then undermining maybe the opportunity that social enterprises would have. Um, uh, and, and I know that there's many other sort of scenarios as well too that where people have actually fallen through the net and um, We'll actually be dealing with that at the next meeting that I'm going to in the Finance Committee itself. But I also welcome uh, just the comment that you've made there about the interdepartmental cooperation that one has, in particular in relation to fraud. Because uh, just as people come forward at the present time, um, um, making us as elected representatives aware of their plight, they very often identify other people who have received grants and maybe are 
hidden away online or the likes of it at the same time. So they sort of are really pointing the finger out already, so without doubt it's out there, and I'm glad to hear that already steps have been taken to address issues like that. Uh, could I just add to that, um, people like M MLAs like yourself, uh, because you're, you're on the front line, you'll pick up intelligence uh, maybe sometimes quicker than we would, uh, just looking at departmental books, what's going on out in communities. So uh, if um, issues like that are coming to your attention, uh, I'm more than happy to, to hear about them. Okay. Could I just ask, um, before we move on, I just want to double check, in terms of our two members who are, who are dialing in, you're, you're content? Have you anything you want to raise? Any questions to ask? Okay. No, thank you, Chair. Sure. Mr Harvey. He's on mute. Um, okay, I think that covers the questions that the members may. Obviously, we will go into this in a more detailed uh, way at the time. Um, but it, the point that Mr. Hillage made at the very outset of the questioning is one that members will have to remember. Members were lobbying for these things, and in many cases, members were advocates for companies around these issues. And, ha and I declare an interest, I've been one of them. We need to be bearing all that in mind. Just before you, you, you would um, move on, can I just ask you to deal with another question, if you don't mind, Mr Donnelly? It's in relation to um, an issue that came up earlier in terms of um, correspondence from uh, Ms Tracy Maharg, the Permanent Secretary, Department of Communities, in relation to uh, a letter dated the 7th of May 2020. It's a provision of indemnity of £5 million. Pounds. Mr O'Toole had a query on that. Mr O'Toole, do you want to address it now? Thank you, Chair. Um, it is hopefully an extremely simple one, which is um, uh, related to my um, ignorance. <coughs> um, but um, the, the Permanent Secretary uh, is uh, it's about an indemnity of £5 million for a, um, an online shopping. Uh, you're aware of it? Um, for mm -hmm. um, My question is, if you're able to help with it, what what is that indemnity for, as it were? I was sort of trying to understand why that creates a uh, contingent liability for the department. Why are they? I, 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 I can't, it's not immediately obvious to me. Well, uh, I suppose the background. Why does she need to come to, to the assembly? Or no, even no. Before, even a step before that, and that might not be your locus. But <coughs> the, is I don't understand why she's so they're working with retailers. Iceland, as to Tesco, whoever presumably to set up a, some kind of online shopping system for people who are in who are in hardship need very welcome. But I don't understand why that process needs to requires a, the creation of a contingent liability for the communities department. Are they underwriting the cost of creating this online portal? Well, the, the, I don't. I'm not over the detail, but I can. I presume they they are to a certain extent, uh, and whether that's capped. So it's something I can look further into. It, it would require, I don't, I, I, I'm sure there's a, a relatively straightforward explanation, so yeah. I don't want to take up your time or others at a busy time, but I, I, it would just be helpful to understand somehow. I'm sure we can find out, but I'm, yes, I'm sure in fact uh, the Communities Committee will look into it. But. Well, it could, be, it could be the issue that they are underwriting and paying for the food, food parcels, for example, that councils are distributing on their behalf, and, and there could be issues in terms of food poisoning, I imagine, it could be one issue, and so that then indemnification could be there yeah. to ensure that the department is um, it's covered that way. I think rather than you deal with that, we'll perhaps write to Ms Maharg asking for clarification so that you will not take your time up, Mr Donnelly, if you're happy enough with that. Uh, no, that, that I, I, I imagine that's what it is. Yes, I yep. think you're probably, I'm sure you're right. Yep. Um, okay. Um, everyone content? We move on to item 8. Okay. okay. Item 8. Um, Members, I would like to invite Mr Donnelly uh, to update the committee on COVID-19, the effect it's, and impact it's had on the Northern Ireland Audit Officers' work programme uh, since the outbreak of the coronavirus. Mr Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I suppose my office has really been working from home uh, since the 18th of March, I suppose in line with uh, <coughs> government policy. and. Um, it's actually worked out uh, operationally from the point of view of the work, uh, maybe better than we might have 
envisaged for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have the IT infrastructure, so everybody has a, a laptop and can access office systems. And um, we have had a, we've always had a working from home policy for staff for about five years. That was sort of capped at uh, people could work from home for a small number of days per year to, to write up reports and that sort of thing. So that side of things have seems, and we've got used to, I suppose, running meetings in a virtual way, uh, use Zoom quite a bit. Uh, we had, um, in fact, a team brief uh, last week. Uh, it was a, a webinar and we were able to address, I think it was 86 of our, our staff. So we've managed to keep the communication lines open. Operationally, I suppose the two main areas of business are departmental accounts that we audit and the public reports that we do. Um, on the account side, um, we've been working closely with the Department of Finance on just uh, you know, we calibrate in deadlines. Uh, <coughs> so, so the deadline for submission of central government accounts has been pushed back to early August. Normally the accounts would be submitted around about now, start start of next month. So uh, that said, um, to our surprise, there, there are some public bodies very determined to, to get their accounts in on time, and some said well, we'll just be a couple of weeks late. But in the round, it'll probably be you know a couple of months late. We cannot do everything offline, so at some point we're, we're going to need access into departmental uh, premises, uh, you know, to, to look at certain things. But we can do more remote than we we thought that we could do. So the normally government accounts are. Uh, done and dusted. Uh, I put my audit certificate in the accounts and they're led before the assembly pre-summer recess. So that's not going to happen this year. They'll be back in general terms a couple of months. Uh, on the reports, um, as you probably know, when after the assembly re was restored in, in January, we, we had quite a large a catalogue of reports, and we discussed those with you at the time. Uh, now with COVID, that back catalogue is going to increase a bit further. Uh, we have a number of reports that are close to finalisation, uh, and where we had done the legwork or the fieldwork prior to COVID, and we're confident we'll get those over the line uh, before before the summer. So. Uh, some of those uh, the, this committee was interested in, like uh, special education. Um, we might not get that over the line for the summer because of, of COVID, but uh, it would be available first thing early autumn. Mm -hmm. So that, that one is, we have a draft report with the, uh, with the permanent secretary. Uh, we have a big report on civil service capacity and capability. Hope to get that out before the summer. We have one on renewable energy, uh, covers issues such as anaerobic digesters and wind turbines, that sort of issue. Uh, addiction services is one on the Department of Health. That had been ready for, for a while, but I uh, took a conscious decision that it was just freezing uh, health work for while they were in emergency mode. Uh, so we'll, we'll pull that one back out. Um, and then there, there's the question of, what, well, what are we going to do about COVID? So we, we normally have a, a three-year rolling uh, public reporting program. So we've been taking stock of that uh, and making some adjustments. Uh, reports that are already, you know, um, that are work in progress, we'll see those through. But uh, we, we, we'll have to look carefully at... Uh, topics further down the, the topic list and make some space for COVID-related uh, expenditure because it's, it's just so vast. So our first foray into that will be uh, really, uh, I suppose, a mapping exercise, just pulling together all the different strands of COVID-related expenditure, which will hope to... And that'll be a very basic factual report. We'll not be getting into any fact, you know, value judgments. We'll just be getting the facts out there and mapping the whole thing together. Uh, we'd hope to get that done before the, the summer holidays. 
And then thereafter, uh, we're going to decide, well, uh, do we put a couple of um, COVID-related topics into the programme, whether it's topics such as the business support or PPP or, or whatever. So we're going to have to think, uh, what, what are the big issues in there? Uh, but also then other topics in the programme, uh, for example, we have a report on uh, PIP, on uh, social welfare. That's not finalised yet, but uh, we, we, we'll add some additional material in there on just the, the COVID, COVID response. Uh, there's other work that we do, for example, uh, we do the, one of the biggest uh, revenue accounts we audit is the rates. Rates revenue is 1.2 billion. So uh, the, the COVID implications for that revenue stream are, are pretty big. So that's something we'll probably do, what I'll call a long form report on the, on the rates accounts. Uh, there are other public bodies, I suppose, affected in a very big way by COVID. So there's the, the DVLA and the, the MOT centers are closed. There's uh, revenue closed down there. So. Uh, big, big issues in, I suppose, the outer parts of the public sector and what I call financial resilience. Uh, you know, your parts of the public sector were already under strain financially before COVID even emerged. Uh, some councils, but uh, also then TransLink. And uh, so it's actually looking at the, the impact of COVID on, uh, you know, financial resilience and vulnerable parts of the public sector. So there's a, there's, there's a lot to do in this, in this arena. Mm. In relation to the um, work going forward, I mean, I think, and you and I have had this conversation, um, in relation to the evidence when we had the head of the civil service and some of the permanent secretaries when we were taking evidence earlier in the year, um, personally, particularly on the back of the RHI inquiry, and around the issue of uh, procurement in terms of public purse uh, in general. I think the piece of work around the civil service capability and capacity is an important thing because I think there was, I'm not going to quote verbatim because I can't remember the quote, but there were clearly indications given here that um, there are gaps shall we say, in the civil service, uh, and uh, perhaps the, in the, 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 in a, and it operates in a different way to the imperial civil service, and we need, we can have inquiries, or we want, we need to learn from that in terms of the capabilities of the civil service and how it works. Moving someone from the Department of Education into another department, when they, when they build, it's good for that person's personal development, but if they don't have a, of a knowledge or an expertise in an area, then that's how we get to the situations that we've seen in recent years, frankly. Uh, and I think that piece of work would be really important. Uh, I, I do agree with you, Chair. It's probably mo one of the more important reports my office has been involved in in recent years. And for the reason you outline there is to get into the underlying causes as opposed to the symptoms of some of the problems our public sector face. Uh, and uh, the type of issue you talk about there, about uh, rotation of staff and the development of staff and the development of leadership capability, there's a whole array of issues in there and they're very important. Uh, you also mentioned uh, RHI, uh, the, the inquiry report actually had asked me in my office to actually track through the implementation of the the recommendations. I'm trying to remember, I think it was 42 or something recommendations in the RHI inquiry, but uh, six or seven of those issues I will address in the, uh, the capacity and capability report. So they're quite germane to, to, that, to that report. Okay. The other thing I think it would be going forward as well, uh, something which will be, I know from talking to friends and colleagues of mine who are working in that area in terms of mental health, general well-being, suicide awareness. That's going to be a huge, and I know you've been doing pieces of work on that, but at, on the far end of this thing, that's going to be a huge issue for government to, to, to grapple with. In fact, not government, everyone to grapple with. Uh, absolutely, Chair. Um, I think it was on the committee's programme to look at mental health in the 
criminal justice system. That was a narrower yes. report. But uh, in our forward programme, uh, we plan to look at mental health more, more generally. And um, when we were reviewing our programme, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago in the office, that's definitively one of the topics that we're keeping in. Um, and the other one uh, you mentioned there was procurement, definitely another topic that uh, w will not be dropping out of the programme because uh, irrespective of COVID, it's, uh, those are two really important topics. Okay. But <coughs> Just before I bring members in, you mentioned you were giving um, additional time. Is there a standard additional time or are you depending on, for example, uh, in terms of submission of accounts and so on? Um, is there a standard time that you're giving? Oh, but presumably that will differ if you're looking at the Department of Health compared to others. Uh, in, in what context? Well, you were saying there in terms of you were giving additional times in terms of the, the financial year end coming in from. Well, well, there's bound to be a bit of extra cost and time to do the accounts just because of COVID issues. Uh, so it means then we we're going to have to go back to our public reporting program. We'll not be able to do everything in it. So some of the lower prior. So we're basically doing. A prioritisation job, and uh, okay. so some of the the topics that probably made sense pre-COVID, we'll we'll not necessarily strip out. We'll put them onto the the longer finger, uh, and actually make space for COVID topics, but also to ring fence two or three topics which we feel are very very important. The mental health is top of that list. Procurement is up there, and uh, a review of the planning system is also. Pretty high up as well. Yeah, I think. I think as elected representative, we're all say here, here to the last point, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, um, Chair. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, just um, in relation to the civil service capacity report, do, had, was that completed before COVID nineteen over lockdown? As in, was the field work as it were completed? Most of the field work was complete. Uh, I have a draft report now with the permanent secretary of. Uh, the Department of Finance. So the, the work is done, and uh, a lot, of, most of the field work was done pre-COVID. And in terms of field work in general, does lockdown? Uh, tell me if this is wrong. The, the two parts of your report, of your reporting structures, are narrow, kind of uh, not narrow auditing. It's not narrow, but auditing, which is spreadsheet based, and then more more qualitative field work based. Into, I presume the latter has, is basically impossible, or is not impossible, but it's much more difficult because you can't eyeball people. And is it important that you're able to meet people in person when you're asking them? In questions? some cases, it depends on the type of report that we're involved in. Um, so probably the process can be divided into three. There's the design and planning of a piece of work yeah. uh, that can be done at the desk, and yeah. then the back end is the writing up of a report and completion. Uh, and also, um, at that stage, uh, you know, we, we're going through engagement with various parties on clearing report. It's a bit in the middle. Uh, the field work is probably slightly more problematic, not just on the reports, but also on the accounts. Uh, but we've managed to do more than we might have thought we could do. Uh, so, uh, unless um, the COVID issue and social distance is going to go on for a good while into the future, it's not going to detrimentally impact too much on, on our operations. And then my very final question, if I may, Chair, just because I'm conscious we're, and I don't want to take up other people's time, but it's just, what you seem to be hinting at before was a, a, you talked about a mapping exercise post-COVID. Am I right to understand that you seem to be almost looking at a bit of work which is about the solvency of the wider public sector as a result of COVID? You talked about Transync, you talked about, I do think you talked about local authorities, but is that, a, is that something you're looking at? Uh, it'll be something that we'll be keeping an eye on uh, in specific <coughs> cases. Uh, we haven't made a call yet whether, it, uh, whether financial resilience across the piece is something we might have to, to look at as well. Uh, so, uh, Not, okay. yeah, so uh, we've still to make calls on precisely how we're going to move on some of these big issues. Yeah, we're very nearly out of time. So Mr. Hillage. Is the last person I've had single to speak, so Mr. Hillich, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, the legal aid report. Where does it sit currently? Oh, legal aid. Um, 
It's, it wasn't initially on our priority agenda, I think. But. No, um, we hadn't. Uh, no, legally it wasn't on the, the, the committee's agenda. Uh, previous committees had quite a few forays into legal aid expenditure. Uh, the big report on um, on the justice side was delays in, uh, in the justice in the system. That, that was the big report in that arena. So that's uh, uh, we were planning to go back in and do a follow up on that one, and um, we still will do that. Uh, it might be a bit later than we had originally envisaged. Yeah, I think just from a public interest point of view, and obviously yeah. we've about this on a couple of occasions in relation to. Uh, Mr. Adams getting a six-figure sum from legal aid into his uh, credit of his case, and it's, it is a public interest story there at the minute in relation to how legal aid actually works. It's brought the whole thing out to the fore again, uh, outstanding in, in a critical way. Right. Uh, the only caveat I would mention is that uh, in my role, I can't question. The rule, our policy is, is the actual implementation mm -hmm. of those. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that would be the justice committee uh, in that context. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, item nine. Any other business? Good. Item ten then is the date, time, and place for the next meeting. Um, if members are content, the clerk and I will liaise with Mr. Donnelly. Around the issue, monitoring very closely what's happening in the world um, and Northern Ireland, in particular, in terms of the uh, the issues. There will be a meeting of the chairs liaison group on Tuesday here. If there's any change in those issues in terms of meetings, length of meetings, and so on, uh, obviously we will be in touch. But everything the focus has to be on all of us uh, is on driving down the R and making sure we get. The, the easement around these restrictions as quickly as possible so we can get back to the sort of work that we were keen to do in terms of the issues we were working with the audit office prior to COVID-19. Can I thank you very much, Mr Donnelly, Mr Barr, your first appearance, uh, Mr Bingham, for your attendance here today, uh, and thank members for their attendance. And um, as we pick up, just wish you all stay safe and take care. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.